going on here. So look, first of all, uh, I suppose I want to welcome everybody. Um, my name is Gary Martin. I'm Director for Economic Development and, and uh, Global Engagement in Donegal County Council. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to join us this afternoon for our second annual Donegal Connect event. Uh, this time last year, we were just after commencing or concluding a 10-day period where we had lots and lots of lovely events around our beautiful county and where many of you had an opportunity to participate and uh, I know some of you uh, had come from abroad to do that and I, I see we have some international uh, visitors here on this afternoon as well. Welcome to all of the folks on the east coast of the states, thanks for joining us. Um, slightly different event this year, uh, this is the second element of the Connect event this year, this morning we had a very informative two hour uh, event relating to remote working and the, I suppose, the experience that the COVID environment has shown um, businesses in uh, all areas uh, of the capacity to work in a rural environment. And uh, I suppose one of the successes that we've had in Donegal on the back of that is the fact that many of our businesses, uh, particularly those in the, the fintech sector and the knowledge based sector, have been able to work very well remotely. And that's something obviously that we want to continue to work on and I suppose to welcome our guests this afternoon, all of the, the representatives today work in or work for or in support of businesses in the innovation sector. Um, they're all involved in the cutting edge of the provision of technology to allow us to do work in a modern fashion, whether that's the provision of infrastructure whether it's the provision of new technologies or whether it's the, the, the provision of employment and some of our larger sectoral areas. So thanks guys for joining us today. It means so much to us that, that you've taken the time to, to join us and to tell us your story today. And I think all of you who are joining us online this afternoon will find it really, really informative because I know that some of the stories are absolutely fantastic. Just a few little bits of housekeeping uh, before I pass you over to the MC for the afternoon, Dr. Stephen Seawright. Uh, who is the Technology Gateway Manager in LYIT. Uh, just uh, all the cameras are turned off and the mics have been muted just due to the, the numbers that we expect here today. There is an opportunity for you to feedback through the questions and answers function at the bottom of the screen. So if you, any of you do have any questions or queries in relation to any of the presentations, please feel free to put in your question. It'll be moderated and the presenter will be asked to respond uh, to those uh, questions. Uh, we have a poll that, that we want to um, have you, have you uh, complete first and foremost. Uh, the poll, I think, is, is basically querying what sector you're representing or best re representing. You see it come up on your screen there now across those different areas. For all of you who are actually on at the moment, you might just uh, click that, please, just so we get a sense of the, the sectoral representations that are actually here uh, as, at, at the moment. And when that's completed, we'll I think we'll share that with you just to give you a sense of the, the areas that you're that you're on from. Joy will share that with us now in one second. Okay, great great representation from local government here today. Colleagues, thanks very much for joining us and supporting us. Very much appreciated. Uh, I think that's followed by uh, state agency. Uh, quite a number of others as well. Uh, maybe we didn't just get the categorizations right there. Uh, fintech, engineering, creative design and uh, construction. For those of you who are in the other sector, you might maybe in the Q&A box just you know, indicate what sector you feel you belong in just so as we capture it properly. So thanks for that, guys. Okay, I'll, I'll pass you over now to uh, Dr. Stephen Seawright, who, as, as I said, the Technology Gateway Manager uh, in the Weiser Labs and LAAT. Stephen will be your MC and your host for the afternoon. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, any queries or questions that you might have, as I said, do through the Q&A and our team, the Economic Development team is available uh, at Economic Development at Donegalcoco.ie for any queries or questions that you might have afterwards. So with that, I'll just hand you over to Stephen. Thank you, Gary. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so I was asked to say just a bit about my background. Um, I spent my career in product development and electronics, telecommunications and software, uh, given away my age, of course, but uh, worked in the UK, Japan, Germany and Ireland. And I've been in with LYT since uh, 2015 as the technology gateway manager there. It's uh, for those of you that aren't from Donegal, um, LYT is Letterkenny Institute of Technology. 
with 4,500 students today, approaching 5,000, I believe, actually. Uh, we have master's and PhD programs from engineering and computer science. And uh, we're working through a, a transformative change at the minute because we're part of the technology university process. Um, this year, we hope to put in our application to become a technolo technology university in collaboration with uh, GMIT and IT Sligo. And when that goes through, there'll be uh, 17,000 students uh, in that cohort um, with 20 different research centers and research uh, groups. So that'll give the region a, a much greater leverage, I believe, uh, to engage with research. It also should help uh, retain students in Donegal and bring more research to Donegal. Um, so it's an exciting time. And if things work out, that'll be in place for the beginning of next uh, academic year. The Technology Gateway uh, Network is a, uh, an Enterprise Ireland um, setup. Um, it's essentially the closest thing you'll get to business development in LYT. I suppose business development, you don't really um, consider that as a university thing. But in this context, it means we're trying to reach out to, to industry and work with business. So the network um, has 15 centers around the country. They're all uh, inside institutes of technology. Of course, the, um, the ones in Dublin are now TU Dublin, but anyway, 15 within uh, what we can call Institute of Technology. And they um, were set up eight years ago um, and attached to uh, strategic research centers in each of those ITs. So Enterprise Ireland identified some areas of expertise and gives some money to uh, introduce this business development function in, in, others, in, in order to leverage that. So, for example, up here in, in, in Donegal, WiseArt, it says Wireless Solutions. Today, that really is an Internet, Internet of Things group, and I'll briefly mention that. But if somebody knocks on my door and we don't have the expertise inside LYT, I would look within this network and find someone that could help them. So, for example, just last week, a company wanted to do some uh, UV validation testing as a method to um, kill uh, COVID. And I was able to refer them to Kappa down in Cork, which is an optical uh, group. You might want to do robotics, for example, and um, Imar and Kerry is a, a suitable place there. And other kind of IT, we've got uh, lots of 3D printing, but we don't have metal 3D printing. And SEAM in, in Waterford would be a group that has that. And there's a fantastic group with expertise in polymers in, in Athlone, and a, a group that does uh, coatings, you know, for example, uh, protective coatings that might go on, on, on glass or go on plastics and stuff like that. So we try not to turn anybody away. Our first protocol is to look internally to see if we can do it inside letter Kenny IT. And if not, we, we look to this network. This will be the closest you'll get to a technology slide today. And uh, I don't want to bore you to death. But as I say, um, our big theme in, in WiseR is Internet of Things. For those who of you that may not have heard of Internet of Things, it's really what it says in that title. Is connecting things to the internet, connecting sensors, for example, to the clouds. So WISER stands for Wireless Sensor Applied Research. So a lot of our work is trying to think, is trying to take dummy things like pressure sensors or, um, or cameras or whatever, and send that information to the cloud. So if you're a software guy, you'll you're, you'll know that um, technology like to talk about seven layers often. And the Internet of Things is something similar. So starting at the bottom, you've got the, the physical world. So designing a device to actually measure that data. And then that has to connect to the world in, in that second layer. So if it is a sensor, it's often uh, run off a battery and it's, uh, it's connecting wirelessly into the cloud. Uh, the third level is where you might do some processing close to that sensor before it actually goes up to the cloud where the data is accumulated and abstracted. You then have maybe an application um, that, that helps you present the, the data in a user-friendly way. And the very top layer then, you're, you're making use of it in your, in, in your business. 
So in LYT, there's three research groups that are involved in that process. There's WISER down at the level one to level three kind of area. Then at the data analytics and computer science department who are looking at things like um, big data, blockchain, and various other um, software uh, pieces of research. Uh, they can also do application development, of course. And the very top layer, layer we've got an interesting group <coughs> and called DICE. It stands for Design, Innovation, Creativity and Enterprise. And they are from the business school. So they have also a um, design department in there. So they take on things like uh, UI and UX. And they also have um, AR and VR capability. They have a long heritage in uh, lean manufacturing and processes. Uh, and then the whole area of uh, bringing digital, digital technology into a company and transforming the way a company might do business. So we've got a full stack over there. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of some of the projects that WiseR has done, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to the, the speakers for today. So this first one is a, <clears throat> an interesting one. It, uh, it's a startup company to set up. One of the founders is actually an academic in LIT. On the left hand side there, you can see a glove. Um, and inside that glove there, are, in, inside the fingers there are little uh, sensors. The sensor image is at the bottom, it's a, it's a bend sensor. So the idea of this glove is to measure the extent that a rheumatoid arthritic patient can actually uh, bend their fingers. So this was done, started maybe two years ago and uh, that particular prototype was manufactured last year. So all before COVID. But the idea is that the patient can be at home using this glove to perform exercises. The data then is transferred from the glove uh, to the mobile phone and then streamed up uh, to the clinician for them to have a look at the data. Um, so very much, if you look at that image of a PCB board and components on it, it's very much the sort of thing that the uh, WiseR would do in electronics design, the software that's connected to their cloud. Next example is actually a, a, one of the examples of uh, work we have done in the marine sector. This particular one was for a company up in Downings who has uh, five uh, shipping boats. And um, when I first uh, got engaged in this uh, sector, um, it was a little bit surprising to, to discover that, um, you know, the boats are owned by businessmen and uh, the businessmen send crews out to sea. And in this particular case, the guys, the fishermen go out in June and they don't come back to Donegal until January. So they're away for, they're away for seven months. Of course, the, um, the business owners want to know what's happening to their boats. And particularly, they want to know how much of a catch that they've caught. Because the land is catch off in, uh, in Holland or Belgium or France. And so they want to have an idea in advance before um, the deal is done, start negotiating before it actually hits port. In those countries. So what we did was uh, we designed um, RFID tags that could be strapped onto these crab pots uh, and the purpose of that is to actually count the number of uh, pots sitting on the vessel. As they're deployed into the sea then we obviously can understand that there's less pots on board and more pots going into the sea. So it's a way of counting the pots on and off. Then we put um, IR sensors on the chutes where the, the crabs are, are stored. So smaller crabs go into one chute, the larger crabs that are gonna be sold go into another chute. So we're able to count the number of uh, crabs being uh, stored on the vessel. So that data then um, uses the, uh, the GPS system and the satellite satcom system on the, on the boat to send the information up to the cloud and back to Donegal for the, for the, bit, for the owners to, to make their negotiation. At the top there, you'll see the funding I mentioned our EI Innovation Partnership. So that's one of the, the Enterprise Ireland funding schemes if you want to do an R&D or an innovation project. There are other ways to do it. And uh, one of my functions, and one of the functions of the other technology gateway managers in different places, is to help you navigate the best way uh, to fund your project as well. The third and last one is um, a... a a newer project I just completed a little while ago. I picked up because the, the founder, Karina Kelly, and her partner were in the Irish Times just last month. 
Um, this doesn't really have any hardware, so it was a, a, a software project. Um, you, you may have all have heard the, the mantra, retail is detail. Well, the challenge or the problem that they identified was um, mistakes happening as people uh, try to take lots of different photographs and images and put them up to, onto a website. So it's all about getting that detail right. Obviously, if you've got the wrong thing up there, you're going to have lots of problems in your business. So the bit of software that we developed um, helps um, someone who's doing a photo shoot automatically identify a particular image and associate that to the SKU code on the product database. And once that's done, then various other bits of information can be attached to the image and the rights information then goes up onto the website. So because that particular um, app or that process is able to rename the files from a photo shoot at more than a thousand images in a minute. And prior to that, it was, you know, hours and hours works of job uh, of a job and lots of lot, lots of problems happening. Uh, Katrina came through the New Frontiers program. That's the uh, an accelerator run by Enterprise Ireland for entrepreneurs who are trying to start up pro, um, a, a company. And uh, one of the speakers today, Gillian Doyle, went through that process. So um, she'll be mentioning her experience in that of that and also where she went uh, from that. So that's just a taste of what we do. Um, that's my details. I'm assuming this presentation might go up there. Um, so really, if you're based in Donegal, if you're considering that you, if you're an entrepreneur, for example, and you want, you want to take a step in that direction, you need to set up a company. But if you have a company, um, we can help you then look into your idea, help you with the prototype and um, take your first step in that direction. Okay. Um, so our first real speaker, not myself, <laughs> is Stephen Mulligan of uh, Three Ireland. Uh, Stephen is the, an enterprise and technology consultant with the company. And with that nice title, he's able to get involved in lots of uh, interesting uh, projects. Um, he's going to bring to our attention today one of the highest profile projects I think that you might have seen on TV. Um, the company, uh, one of their strap lines I could see on the internet is uh, a better connected life. And I think what the story you're gonna see here today is a better connected life with a better quality of life, I believe. It's an inspirational story. It's an exemplar of how well the whole um, country of Ireland and the whole county in particular is connected. Um, so Stephen's gonna give us the inside story about the, the most connected island on the planet. Stephen. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, lovely to kind of virtually meet you all. It's, it's kind of weird. I'm used to doing these kind of presentations in large halls full of people and uh, seeing all the lovely smiling faces out in the audience. So uh, we're, all, we're all in this kind of weird world where we are together. Um, so yeah, hi, everybody. My name is Stephen Mulligan. Uh, and thanks, Stephen, for the intro. Uh, as Stephen said, I'm a, an enterprise technology consultant with Three Ireland and, and Three Business, I suppose, specifically. Um, and I suppose I'll let you into a little secret. I'm the enterprise technology consultant. There isn't, there isn't more than one. <laughs> um, so uh, my job title was kind of something I sort of invented after about three months of doing the job when I kind of figured out what it was supposed to be. And really, my job is, is to get out and meet the businesses up and down uh, the country uh, who are going through various different parts of their, their evolution all the time, right? a business that's growing or a business that's struggling or a business that's expanding out into different countries or whatever it might be. And my role there is to try and figure out how do I uh, match up some of the business challenges that are customers have to um, the technologies that we have uh, in our armory that might be uh, who are That was kind of deliberate because uh, I, I want to this. Excuse me, Stephen, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. You're, you're breaking up. I think if your mic is up towards your mouth a bit more. Cheers. Let me make sure the microphone is using the right one. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, so let me try that. Is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Thanks. Is that better? Okay, yes, cool. 
So yeah, so uh, I, I was just saying that the, the the reason for wearing the same shirt as I have in the picture is to celebrate the fact that this is the first time I've worn anything with long sleeves in seven months, uh, and I figured I might as well uh, go back to go back to my time in in uh, in Aranmore and, and and wear that shirt. So, uh, so that picture was taken on the on the beautiful island of Aranmore. Um, I suppose we started this project about two years ago, um, when uh, I was asked would I like to help create the most connected island in the world, and you know. That that's a, that's an, an opportunity you don't really turn down. It's when somebody comes to somebody like me, who's an engineer by training, electronic engineer, computer computer programmer, project manager, uh, consultant. Um, you know, to to get an opportunity to work on a project like this is is absolutely wonderful. So I, I said I'd, I'd be more than delighted to. Um, so over the period of of maybe six months to a year, we 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 put together um, a. Uh, uh, what what was really done as a, a kind of a marketing exercise within three, um, initially to try and try and show showcase our technology out to the market, um, became something more than any of us ever thought it would be. And I'll, I'll try and take you through, hopefully in about um, about twenty minutes or so today, what what happened there. So so let me introduce you to to the um, the lovely island of Ironmore. For any of you who don't know it, I'm sure many of you on the call are, are from the environs and know it. Um, but if any of you don't know where Ironmore is, um, it's not uh, one of the Iron Islands. In case any of you don't know, and I, I spent a lot of time correcting people on that one. Um, but it's about uh, 5k off the coast of Donegal. Uh, as you can see in some of the pictures there, it's a it's a fabulously beautiful, rugged place. Um, about 469 people live there according to the last census, and I'm hoping by the time the next census rolls around, that number will have grown considerably. Um, there's ferries that go out to the island every day. Uh, the schools are fantastic on the island. There's two primary schools and a secondary school. And in fact, the schools are so good that people come from the mainland over to our more to go to school. Um, there's a very, very good health center there. Um, and the, the industries that have, I suppose, been traditional uh, stalwarts of the island are things like fishing and farming. Uh, and obviously, it's a it's a very uh, well known tourist destination for a number of reasons, uh, not least of which is the um, the Gaeltacht that is there, and many of us uh, as kids would have gone up to Ireland more as uh, as Gaeltacht students. Um, but ultimately, it's physically cut off from Ireland and and therefore the rest of the world. Um, and so, part of what we thought of was if we can do it there, we can do it anywhere. Uh, and what we wanted to do was treat um, Ireland more the island like any business that we would go and talk to uh, and figure out what we could do uh, to help. So if we look at some of the issues that Ironmore had to deal with, um, considerably aging population, um, you know, the, the as you can imagine with that sort of demographic shift where the where the age the age is starting to go the wrong direction, then your your intake into school starts to come down. Uh, and once that starts to come down then you know you, it, it has a knock-on effect. So what you want to try and do there is is create the conditions for people to come back to live on the island um, so that they can bring their kids there, put the kids into school, the kids can grow up on the island, they can grow to love the island lifestyle like the way that the people live there do, uh, and that will have a, a kind of a knock-on effect over time. But also then to be able to live and work on the island uh, was a challenge because um, the island's traditional industries, um, you know, I suppose in the modern world, a lot of what's happening is moving online. Uh, a lot of what's happening is is stuff that's being done uh, on a computer, uh, and obviously you need um, significant broadband capability to be able to do that. Um, and I suppose what we were trying to do then was try and figure out, based on some of those challenges, how can we um, how can we as three help to 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 change that. Um, and so I suppose part of what we looked at was was how do the how do the, the how does the island build on its strengths? And I suppose when we went up to visit the island, we did what we called a recce in 2018, where we went up to meet the guys, and you'll actually see in the videos later on some of the pictures from that time. Um, we were all kind of blown away by by the people that we met on the island, um, the community spirit that was there, um, how good the schools were, how good the healthcare was on the island. Um, and in 2017, before we even got this whole project kicked off the ground, um, the, the folks on the island had uh, launched a campaign to encourage the diaspora to, to relocate back. But there was significant barriers in that because, you know, as I said before, the employment opportunities may not have been there um, and connectivity wasn't what it, you know, what it could be on the island. Um, 
And what we looked at as three was, look at an island is a is a microcosm of a larger of a larger society. Um, and sure, if we can get it right there, we can kind of do it anywhere, right? And and so for us, selfishly as three, um, what we wanted out of this was a fantastic story to tell to showcase our technologies. But what we really wanted to do while we were doing that was was help a community to uh, become sustainable over time. And what we said from the start was we're not there as a savior, we're there as a helper. So ultimately the community has to save itself um, and the community wants to save itself. But all we were there to do was to give them a hand and to try and help. Um, so that's kind of the background on on what we did. And then sort of, I suppose, um, this was a picture I took when I was on the island the first time. Um, and if any of you been to Ironmore, if you've gone over the back near the lighthouse, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize this scene. Um, my breath was absolutely taken away when I when I walked over. Like I'm from uh, the east coast of Ireland, so I'm I'm from uh, from North Dublin. Um, and whenever I go out to Hoth, I always walk around at the back of the the island of Hoth or the, the headland of Hoth, and it reminds me of this scene because there's parts of of Hoth Head that re remind me of this. But but nothing really kind of prepares you for how dramatic the scenery is. But what we wanted to figure out is how could we bring a better connected life to Ironmore. So the guys talked about that idea of the better connected life. Um, and what we realized was that the way we would do that is by building the most connected island in the world. And what I'll take you through now is how we, we went about doing that. Um, to take a little step back though and talk about funding, right? So this is the reality of, of these situations that these things need to be paid for. And I, I had this conversation with some of my other um, public sector customers the other day who we've also assisted in um, some proof of concept activity over the course of COVID. Um, and what I said to them is, guys, you need to get real about funding. So we as three can help with um, proof of concepts. We can help with these kinds of things. But our budget for that isn't endless, as you can imagine, right? So you guys have to be willing to fund some of these things if you want to try them out and get used to doing them. And in fairness to the guys on the island, they were masters at uh, finding funding where there was funding to get. So you can see various sources of funding there between Department of Rural Community, uh, Donegal County Council, and so on. Um, there was there was funding found from all sorts of places, but in 2018, when we got together with the community council, we were so impressed. We figured, you know, these guys are are serious about what they're doing. They're not just looking for a load of freebies. They're actually looking to, for a proper partnership that can can last for a serious amount of time. And they have a vision of what they wanted to do. And that vision was to create the first offshore digital hub uh, in Ireland. So many of you now are familiar with digital hubs. Uh, and COVID really has kind of shone a light on this stuff, which is um, how do we re work remotely, um, but yet still have some sort of a, a, a community feel and how do we actually see other human beings I'm talking today from my house. Um, so digital hubs are a way to do that. And so um, over the course of maybe six months, uh, we went uh, to the island, found a location, uh, with the guys, so there's a there's those of you again who know the island will probably know this, but for those of you who don't, um, there was a B and B on the island called the ferry boat, uh, and this is the pool room um, that you're looking at of the ferry boat uh, pre pre transformation. Um, and when you look at this, it kind of doesn't exactly scream modern digital hub, right? So there's <laughs> I think there's a there's a like a Samsung printer there from uh, a fax machine from about 1975. Um, you know, we looked at this and kind of went, okay, this is a space we can work with, but what are we going to do? So over the course of maybe um, uh, two to three months, we started to go, what can we do? What can we build? What can we design? And so we worked with our design teams, um, tradespeople on the island, uh, and a serious amount of hard work from the community council started to do this transformation. And you can see slowly, over, slowly but surely over time, we started to turn this pool hall into what eventually became known as Modam, the digital hub. And um, this is normally the point where I pause for rapturous applause because it's such a such a fantastic transformation. Um, but the guys did an amazing job in this. And I, I can remember coming up, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd only visit the island every you know couple of months during this process and I'd be seeing photographs and whatever. And I came up for the for the visit where I th this picture was finally taken. Um, and the day I arrived, there was people out on the deck sewing those plants that you can see there hanging from the ceiling into the frame and there was people painting stuff and there was stuff in bubble wrap and and then they said right guys you're going out in a boat and we're going to take you around the island and do a tour around the island and in the time it took us to go and do the boat tour and come back 
they had this finished. It was an unbelievable transformation in the space of a couple of hours. You know, that like one of those um, Dermot Bannon videos that you might see where it's like the, 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 the fast motion thing at the end, but that was in real time. Um, so when we came back, suddenly it, it, it had just come together and it was, it was a fantastic moment to see it. Uh, and this, so this is Modem, the digital hub. So it's a, um, a, a serious workspace where you can bring people in. Um, it's a commercially viable organization um, which has been obviously battered this year by COVID, which is a nuisance because it should have been really having its own this year. But look at that, it'll come back over time. The guys I know at the moment are working on COVID proofing it. Um, and, you know, that, that will take its time, but they'll, they'll get there and they'll get up and running again. Um, but yeah, super job and an amazing, uh, amazing final result for this one piece. And this is just one piece of what we did in the island. I'll talk a little bit more about the rest in a second. Um, where this all came about was an idea from a guy called Neil Gallagher. Neil uh, works for a software company in, in London. Uh, Neil, as you might guess from his surname, is a Donegal native. He's an Aaron Moore native, in fact. Uh, and he always wanted to come back and work on the island. Um, but he struggled with when he would come back, uh, the broadband wouldn't be up to snuff and he wouldn't be able to do what he needed to do. Uh, so he'd end up back in London. And what he described to us was, um, I'm paying a fortune in rent to sit in my apartment in London, working remotely into my uh, office. And I could be paying a fraction of that uh, living at home in, in Ironmore and being able to do it there. And that's really what he wanted to do. Um, so Neil was kind of the inspiration for this. Um, and you'll actually see, I'm going to play a little video for you now, which kind of details uh, some of the early parts of this. And um, hopefully you'll hear the sound as this comes through and see the video. Um, and you'll hear Neil speaking and you'll also hear uh, Adrian and Seamus from the uh, Community Council. And you'll even see a little glimpse into one of the really early meetings we had um, on the island when we met the guys for the first time. Uh, so let me go ahead and press play on this. It pains me to say this, but up until a couple of weeks ago when a young girl was born, and that was the first child was born on the island for three years. So, you know, you do the maths in that, it doesn't look good long term. There's no better place to live than Arnmore, but we have been decimated by immigration. I think, like a lot of other Arnmore people, we have this mad hankering to get back home. The only thing that's really going to help people to work remotely is the best connectivity you can get. There are no opportunities here. The majority of my age group, they've left the island and haven't come back. We're very top-heavy with elderly people. About 45% of the population is over the age of 65. The biggest silence I hear on Iron Moor is the sound of children. And it, it's only when you don't have it, the silence is deafening. You chat to Irish people, they are very proud of where they come from, and islanders are probably even prouder. As an islander, you never really leave. The draw is always there. Moving home has always been a dream, but the fundamentals of connectivity for my line of work just made it unfortunately impossible. How's it going, Dara? Hey, Matt, how are you? My company develops high-end educational games and immersive environments. I need secure, fast, reliable connectivity. When I first really started trying to work back here, the first probably three days, I almost went out of my mind. I was getting about five to 10 minutes of connectivity up until about nine o'clock. You're always slightly nervous when you wake up in the morning whether there's gonna be connectivity there or not. What would make Iron more a sustainable place? What would make it a place where people not only would want to come, but when they do come, can survive and thrive? We talk to business customers all the time, and the first thing we ever do is we listen. Tell us about what you need to grow the island into the future, and I suppose we looked at it the same way we would any other business. A huge amount of our businesses that would be major corporates around Ireland would run off 100 meg in all their sites. When you get 100 meg up and 100 meg down, and it's full on synchronous 100 megs, because then we could provide a fabulous internet connection back. The technologies we're putting in place are gonna have a, a real and profound impact. This is about people and about making a difference. We had a conference call, but I 
couldn't really make out who was at it. Were, were any of you yeah. here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't approach it as just a purely technical exercise. You get to hear all their stories and you kind of get a bit attached. You want to make sure that you're giving the people the best experience that they can get from the three network. The whole thought process around this is to try and bring the connectivity to the island, to try and generate some employment, bring people back to the island. A digital hub was something that we thought would be a great asset to the community because it would be a shared workspace and they can do anything in any job from that space. I'm in London paying a fortune for just the cost of living. So if I can do that in Arnmore, where the cost of living is a fraction and I have no commute, that's, from my perspective, is just fantastic. So hopefully you, uh, you, you got a sense there of, of some of the stuff that, that, that happened in the, in the lead up to Modem being um, built. So you saw at the very end there um, that shot of, of the outside of the building. It's funny looking back at it now to see, um, to, to re remember, I suppose, what it looked like back then. Um, so what were some of the things that, that we actually put in there? So in uh, the hub itself, we were, uh, obviously there's a lot of physical build that had to be done. So the, 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 the design and, the, and the, the fit out of the, of the building had to be done, but also um, the high speed connectivity that went in there uh, was tricky because, um, you know, it's uh, five kilometers away from the mainland and there's no fiber line on the island. So what we used was a, a technology called a wireless lease line. And what you see in that picture there is the three engineer up on the, on the top of that building, um, putting up a microwave dish. And that microwave dish points back to the mainland uh, and establishes a point-to-point -point microwave link uh, that, that can give very high-speed internet connectivity. Um, within, the, within the building then, we built a secure network. So we built a local area network like you'd have in your, in your office. Um, we also um, put the, all that technology or all that connectivity back to a firewall to uh, provide security. Uh, and then we built a whole bunch of other um, ICT solutions around the island uh, to try and support health, environment and fisheries. I'll talk a little bit more about those in a second. Uh, and then we also used a technology called Mobile Broadband Plus to provide a lot of the other connectivity in the island as well. Um, so if I look at um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure we did, and, and Stephen, talked or, uh, Stephen talked a lot about in the IoT earlier on, the idea of, of um, data analytics and insights. And one of the things we wanted to make sure we did was um, put something in there that was measurable. So you can see from these dashboards, I won't get into all of them in detail, obviously, but if you think about things like uh, daily activity over the previous 30 days, which was the busiest day? Um, you know, what, what hours of the day are things busy? Uh, what's the temperature inside like versus the temperature outside? It gives us great uh, metrics in terms of, of what's happening within the, within the hub itself. Um, and that's great, again, from, from a resource planning and, and uh, uh, business planning point of view. Um, healthcare was one of the things we wanted to look at very closely because um, with an aging population on the island, um, you know, the medical team on the island is, is, is challenged every day because there's, you know, it's a great facility they have there, but there's only so many of them. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do was make sure that the, the medical center had really good broadband. So uh, we used a product called Mobile Broadband Plus, and this is something we used in a number of places on the island um, to provide. And to give you an example of what that does, it's an, it's an outdoor antenna instead of an indoor antenna for, for 4G. Um, and that will allow basically, a, a, let's say an indoor antenna might give you three megs, an outdoor antenna might give you 30 or 40. Um, so it would give you a massive boost in terms of your, your broadband footprint. And obviously then as the network uh, continues to grow and, and uh, evolve over time, that will, um, that will only get better. Um, and so what that allows Dr. Quinn to do now, that's Dr. Quinn on the right, in case you're not sure, um, is to do things like attending virtual meetings online, do his, his training online, and also then gives him the capability for patients uh, to be able to have a remote consult with uh, a hospital on the mainland. So you can imagine the benefit of that for somebody, uh, you know, who might be in their 70s or 80s, not to have to travel down to uh, Beaumont in Dublin or something like that for a for a simple routine uh, examination with, the, with their physician. So a hu huge benefit from that point of view. Um, the other thing we wanted to do was look at the idea of independent living. Um, so again, with the older people on the island, um, we wanted to have those sensors, going back to what Stephen was talking about earlier on, to help maintain independence for people. Uh, and what they would do is measure stuff that was happening uh, within the person's house, quietly and passively in the background. 
um, and then be able to send alerts out to the contacts. Uh, I'll play one more quick video here to just show you what that means. Everybody wants to remain in their own home. So any positive initiative that helps the older person to remain independent and to feel secure and safe is always to be welcomed. Those sensors are going to allow us to monitor patterns of behaviour and that will allow us to alert automatically if we detect something that's out of the normal. It certainly gives peace of mind to relatives that don't live here. Mm. They don't have to constantly think, is my mum all right? Is my yeah. dad okay? Yeah. So that gives you a little sense of, of some of the work we did with the, with the other uh, care stuff. So um, just to show you now again, to, I suppose, to, to talk about what we did, but also then talk about the activity that now happens because of that. Um, so you can see here three different text messages. These are real texts that have gone out and obviously I've taken out the person's name just to, to protect their identity. Um, but you can see there the various different things that we're, we're measuring in the different houses. So uh, in one house, we're measuring the time, the number of times the kettles used, um, uh, how many times the water uh, was used in the house, uh, how many times the toaster was used. You know, it's a real kind of day-to-day -day average normal stuff, um, uh, what temperature it was in the house. But again, great for next to kin or carers to be able to see what's happening um, with the folks they're looking after. Um, obviously, fishing is a huge part of the island. Um, uh, one of the things the fishermen identified for us was um, water flow within tanks uh, for crab to make sure they're kept alive and also then sensors on the, on the lobster pots. Uh, to make sure they knew where they were. Uh, again, I'll show you a quick little video of this uh, just to give you a sense of it. Lobster and crab need a constant flow of seawater while they're in the tank. And what our sensor will do is make sure that the flow of seawater is monitored so that you always trust that your catch will arrive alive. This boy, it's a bit different to what you're used to. So that's going to use the, the network that we've put out as far as the island okay. to send data back so that you'll know at all times where that boy is. Lobster. Um, obviously, a place as beautiful as Ironmore, you want to maintain the environment as best you can over time. So again, put a network of sensors out all over the island. So everything from air, water, weather, um, we wanted to kind of measure everything that was going on. Um, and again, here, just to, I suppose, show the, the output of that, uh, there's now a weather dashboard where you can see wind speed, wind direction, trends over time, humidity, rainfall, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so again, really interesting, really useful information. And again, anybody who lives on the island will tell you how important weather is for them. Uh, it changes like the weather. Um, in terms of education, uh, this is Anya in, in teaching her class on the island. Again, um, you know, our, all of our kids nowadays are, are used to online learning with things like interactive whiteboards and so on. Um, and again, we needed really good broadband to let them do that. Uh, and, and again, enrollment numbers have, have increased since, uh, since on the island. Um, one thing you may have heard of was the, what happened in terms of the international reach. So uh, there was a press release put out basically welcoming people to come back and live on the island. Um, and I think uh, Adrian and Seamus, their email server just melted because they got about 3,000 inquiries from all over the world. Um, so it was a careful what you wish for a moment, uh, but they certainly got plenty of uh, notice and, and it went everywhere. Uh, these are just some of the snippets of things from ABC News, CNN, uh, Sydney Morning Herald, it literally went global, this idea of uh, the most connected island in the world. So um, I think the emails have finally slowed down now, but uh, the guys were, were killed for a while trying to, trying to get through them all. Um, so just very quickly to finish up, uh, I wanted to talk about the impact of this and, and what uh, it has done. So again, all of these figures are pre-COVID, guys. So, so um, you know, we have to understand that what happened this year uh, has had a huge impact uh, on the island, but obviously the health and safety of everybody there was the most important thing to get on uh, top of. So um, tourism is up though by 84%, ferry traffic up by 150%. Uh, Digital Hub had, has users booked in now to be there all the time. Obviously it had to close for a period of time because of COVID um, and over time then the, you'll have more people coming in to use that. Um, but uh, in fact, with with what's happened with remote working in uh, in COVID times, it, more and more people have to work remotely, and so what we've actually done on the island is is more relevant than ever in many ways. Um, and despite all those challenges, people are uh, moving back there and spending more time there. Um, so to finish up, um, I suppose in summary, mobile connectivity can. Uh, th this project was originally titled "Can Technology Make Babies?" and and over time, I'm sure it will. Uh, that's something that takes a period of time, obviously, as you can imagine. Um, 
but uh, you know the the key thing is building a resilient community and this is what the guys are all about on the island it's it's about creating a place where people want to come and live uh, and not just come for holidays but come for for longer periods and and, and stay um and you know we will try as a mobile operator to support that and to to help out but connectivity is key um, and as time goes on uh, and as the network improves this will only get better and better um it's a long term um uh, partnership that we have with the guys and, and we're delighted to be involved with this uh, and so that I think is me and I'm a couple of minutes over my time so apologies. No, no, no problem. Thanks Stephen. Um, I think if uh, any story gives an example of the power of remote working and con connectivity it, 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 it's that one you know and ah, uh, it's you. really an example of uh, of what's possible with, with technology. Fantastic. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's something we're incredibly proud of. And, you know, as Irish people, we're often very quick to go, Asher, it was nothing. This was a huge deal, right? And it was a huge deal because a huge amount of people uh, within three and outside of three put their backs into it and put their shoulders to the wheel and every other cliche you can imagine. Um, but to be honest with you, it was an absolute joy to do it. And I, I've never, and I'm, I'm 26 years at this game of, of IT and telecoms that I've never enjoyed a project like it. It was uh, it was a real, it was an honour to be involved with this. And, uh... That's a fantastic journey. Um, I'm sure people who haven't been through that process don't really appreciate how tough it is. When you talk about competitive start fund, and I imagine every stage of that whole journey has been competitive. <laughs> well, anyone who hasn't seen me in four years kind of takes a step back because the wrinkles and the grey hair that have come through right. has been, uh, if, you know, you wear your war wounds, I think, is part of being a founder. But um, yeah, it's been extremely challenging. Don't get me wrong. It's But at the same time, you're faced with new challenges every day. So it's really busy. It's really enjoyable. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't change it. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Um, we have about uh, 12 minutes for Q&A uh, if, if we want to keep things on track. So I'd encourage people to ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, while that's happened, maybe just one, another one for Jill, if you don't mind. Would you have any advice for people setting up their own company, in particular in Donegal? Yeah, um, the first thing I guess that we did was check the broadband speed um, and you can just ring and get it. So make sure that you can work. Uh, the innovation hubs the enterprise centers they're all amazing and they are springing up much more so and if you can use one of them i you know i guess COVID is a big challenge but if you can to try and minimize your costs all the time i would highly recommend it they just weren't available to us in our draw at the time but the one thing i would say is if you're considering it just don't go and see the local enterprise office um, go and see new frontiers and talk to people because if you can make a business plan and convince yourself that you have an idea that can make money, then you know you've half the validation done for yourself that it's worth investing the effort. But definitely go in. It's still the start your own business course is still the best hundred euro I spent in the business um, was doing that. And how did you feel about new frontiers? Absolutely. New Frontiers took us to a different level. You know, uh, the Start Your Own Business allowed us to frame what we thought was the problem. And the New Frontiers gave us actually the bandwidth to go and really do the market validation and work out what the product was going to be and who we were going to sell it to. And as I said, each phase just builds on the other. So as you grow up, you get into different programs. And yeah, it allowed us then to go and raise our first bit of money to get a pilot up and going because it was one of our challenges. So yeah, at the very beginning, there are just two key milestones that I would say, because the challenge that you're going to get on whether your business is the right mm. thing, that there is a business there, um, you're going to get that from, from those programs. Yeah, I was very impressed about, about the number of accelerator programs you've gone through. Um, unfortunately, what the question I have um, is also for Gillian uh, that's come through. Um, how might Brexit affect Sri Grown's uh, sustainability and continued development? Yeah, uh, it's a huge, huge thing for anybody who's trading. Um, so, first of all, uh, last year, well, we, we created a branch in the UK. So we have an Irish parent company. So all our intellectual property goes through the branch if it's being utilised in the UK. 
and we have a subsidiary for the sales. So all our sales contracts are through that, which means VAT revenue, all of that is built basically into the UK model. And the big challenge we have is the currency, the stability of the currency. So when you're dealing with FX, uh, you can either hedge, you can guarantee an amount of transfer, and they're just insurance policies you put in place to do it. The big things that would be is you have to work in with your cash flows. Uh, you need to work in multi-currency cash flows, work out what your exposure is and make sure that you manage them. Because we're software, we don't have a world trade tariff uh, that comes on us, our ability to trade, but there could be exports, there could be customs. We don't know. Um, and so what we did was we built in a 10% variability into our pricing um, in order to be able to compensate for that. So that's what we've done, but there's so many unknowns. I don't think even an expert actually knows what the best thing to do. But for us, they were some of the, the things that we tackled. Last one for you, Gillian. Um, in terms of that, in terms of Brexit, do you have to keep the data for your UK customers in, in, in the UK and then yeah. other European? Yeah. So each customer, uh, some of them don't mind. Some of them couldn't give a hoot where it is. It depends on the type of customer, but your big financial institutes will absolutely demand that the, um, the data is in its territory. So that was why our partnership with Microsoft was so important was that we can spin up um, a version. And it was the same, it was for scalability. If we go to Canada or the US to be able just to deploy in those locations very easily, it was so important. But yeah, we have um, multi-territory business continuity and disaster recovery as well. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have a shout out from Brenda Hegarty there. The local enterprise office in partnership with MDRC is looking for female entrepreneurs to follow in Jillian's footsteps. So if there's any ladies listening here today, please, please go for it. Although I think Jillian mentioned in her presentation, they went down the general route, um, but sure. Take the money where you can get it and hang on to it and make a stretch. Um, there's a question for Joe. Maybe Joe can understand this better than me. Um, Joe, could you share a link to the innovation group of 850 people? Maybe yeah, I wasn't no. listening. I'd <laughs> pop it into the to the Q and A as well. Um, so that that group is the if you go on meetup.com and I put a link in there as well. But if you go to meetup.com, it's it's North by Northwest. So N X N W. Um, it's over about over 850 people now signed up. Um, it's basically free. Takes place every it was monthly in person. Now gone online. There's actually one tonight. So there's, yeah. if, if you really want it, if you're really keen, there's a there's a meetup today today at six o'clock on Jamstack. So it's uh, it's quite technical, uh, but it's it's done in a way that if you go along, you can learn some some stuff, learn some new technology. Back pre-COVID times, it used to be uh, take place in person. We used to have it rotating around various different businesses in Donegal. And um, so it was nice. There was a nice social element to it as well. But unfortunately, we've had to take it online. But um, yeah, it's it's there. Keep an eye out. As I mentioned, we were to run uh, an all-day tech conference, uh, two, two, two sphere uh, all-day tech conference in June. It, it was actually June 6th at LYIT. So LYIT were sponsoring the space. Donegal County Council, amongst others, were the sponsors as well. And um, so our hope would be uh, to to have that take place next year. We didn't go originally online with it because we hadn't ran it ever, so we're a bit hesitant to to jump straight to the virtual setting. But obviously, pending how things go with COVID, but our our hope would be to look at June next year to kind of hold the same. And again, from the community perspective, you know, we were getting support from the likes of Kinniger, who were going to provide some sponsorship of the beer and stuff as well, which again, I think really talks to, similarly when we did hackathons, um, it really talks to, and Kinnegar would have assisted us then as well. I think it just really talks to when something like this happens, like a big event, the amount of people that just support it from all across the county, whether it be Donegal County Council or just the space and, and all of that, I think is very, very important. And it's why one of the things we're really excited about is the Alpha Innovation Center that Donegal County Council got the the uh, the funding for a space like that, and I think it talks to Gillian's point as well. It, sometimes the physical space, and again, it's, it's obviously pre-COVID, but physical space does matter for sometimes being able to get together and be able to knock things out and that type of thing. So I think an innovation hub in the in the town of Letterkenny will will be significant. We're very excited about it, about how we can go down and learn from others, share the experiences. It'll be a great place to have the tech meetups again yeah. when we're when we're in a position to do so. But we'll continue to do them virtually as we go. But for those that are interested on the phone, uh, our hope would be it'll be a it'll be a ticket event next year. 
So the hope would be, so do stay tuned to the meetup.com website and that URL. It'd be fantastic to see some of the folks uh, here on the call. And, if, and again, it would be a call for speakers going out there early next year. So if there's something that you're interested in sharing a story, uh, absolutely would love to, to see them because it's, you know, a tech community vibrant like that in a region goes a huge part to keeping that ecosystem strong. And uh, I'm very much look forward to, to seeing if we can make that a reality next year. I have another question, maybe Joe, you could um, take this, please. Just how do the salaries compare between Donegal and Dublin? How does the salaries compare? Look, there is there is a difference. There, there is obviously a difference, and I'm I'm sure Gillian will will see the same. Um, I think the reality is what we try to do is be competitive for a the region, but more importantly, factoring in the cost of living differential. I mean, it's significantly different. Uh, the cost of an apartment in London or an apartment in, in Dublin, then, and you know, it's typically a house in, in Donegal, a full family home in Donegal for the equivalent of maybe a one bedroom apartment that you're probably sharing. So it, it can be competitive. I mean, it's a total package in our case, it's, it's including things like life insurance and other bits and pieces as well. But, you know, we try to be competitive for the region. We offer a career, and I think that's been the difference. Uh, a lot of people start in one role and have gone on to do other things. We have a huge focus on, on learning. You heard the mention, LYIT and the, the courses. We would support people in their uh, education assistance as well. So, um, I mean, in short, there is a difference. You're not going to have a senior developer in Donegal making the same as, as, as Dublin uh, right now. But I suppose the difference is, to, and Gillian nailed it, you know, do you want to go down to Dublin and spend uh, three hours a day in the car commuting in, to, in from Selbridge or do you want to be able to get out to, you know, play golf on the coast uh, after six o'clock on a full day's work and still have daylight till 11? That's that's ultimately the difference. Our thing's a lifestyle decision uh, in the area and hopefully the tenure of our people has shown that it's been one that many people, I'm 15 years here, family and all are from here. So I think that's that's really what, what the sale is. A lifestyle choice, but an opportunity to have a career with a, with a Fortune 100 company, but in a region like Donegal. And I think hopefully you've heard today the value of what that community yeah. brings as well. I think Gillian highlighted the, the retention point. You know, the people tend to stay in their job in Donegal much longer than somewhere like Dublin or any, any city. Yeah, I do think though as well, like people often bring up the idea of this cheaper salary. It's a cheaper workforce. Uh, it, to be honest, it really irritates me. Um, and the reason why it does do so is... If I look, we have Dublin, Donegal and Birmingham. Why would I penalise somebody for wanting to live in Donegal on their salary for what they want in Dublin? Um, Joe's absolutely right. There's a small element for us in where you look at the costs. So even childcare for our team is so much lower here than it is in Dublin. And they will make that decision themselves. But I think having this huge scale of where, well, this is Dublin and this is Donegal and it you know, to us, that just doesn't work. It is always about the package. Um, and when you're employing people for the long term and for commitment, like we've employee share options, it's a different ball game um, to just saying, oh, well, you're going to be in for 18 months. So there's your salary for whatever amount of time and, and off they go, you know. So just do bear that in mind when it comes to salaries. Just say, Joe, you're right. It's about the package. Um, but it's also about not penalising those who choose to live in Donegal for not picking to live in Dublin. Okay, thank you. Um, we had um, someone on from Boston who loved watching uh, the videos of Aaron Moore and the Gale Talk brings back many fond memories. Must be a native then. Great job in bringing them up to speed and on the te technology. Stephen, I mean, I think the big point there is your, um, the project has actually got something that's going to have a huge impact and maybe and reversing the population decline there in Ironmore. Um, yeah, I mean that, that, that's the idea, right? So the the whole point about it was to try and try and uh, aid the community to become sustainable over time, and that that's really what it's all about. Because you know, uh, it, it, is Ironmore for everybody to go and live in? No, because it's a different type of lifestyle, right? Um, I mean, Donegal is different to Dublin. Ironmore is different to Donegal. It's different to Dublin, um, and it's a very particular type of lifestyle living on an island off the coast. Um, and it's not for everybody, but if you like it, you'll love it, right? And if you go there and you like it, you'll love it, you'll never come back, right? But in order to make that sustainable, you've got to, you've got to have a sustainable industry base on the island. And that's what we were trying to help, I suppose, was to, to create that and to, to assist the guys in doing that. Um, and it is such a beautiful place. Like you go out there, like I, I, 
I've been out there several times and I've loved it every time. I, I know I couldn't live there. I'm a city guy. I'm sitting in the middle of them right here. Right? But uh, I, I can see why people love it, right? And I can see why people go out there. Like I've tons of friends who went to the Gaelic there as kids um, and still talk about it. Um, if, uh, one of my son's teachers uh, in St. Vincent's School in Sutton is, is uh, she's a, is, is old Irish teacher, was, is one of the teachers from Ironmore. Um, her daughter's named after the music festival that happens on the island. Like if that's, if that's how much it gets into your blood, right? Um, she lives in Rohini in the middle of Dublin and she's absolutely in love with there and more. So it's, the, it's that kind of place, right? It, it gets, into your, uh, gets into your soul, I think. Um, we'll just have one more question here and then we'll move on to our, our we're going to have a, a VR um, demo. So those people who registered in time would have got a, a in the post, the old cardboard um, goggles or glasses or something. So get those out and get ready to use them. Um, I suppose this, this question was for all, all of the panel and it really, but it does fit into to, to Iron War a lot actually. How does the panel feel that the development of people coming back to Donegal has helped improve local communities? So, you know, if Donegal is open for business, it's clear you can set up anywhere. We're all assuming that it's a, a positive thing, bringing loads of people from Kildare and other places to, to live amongst Donegal folk. Is that, a, is that improving things? And uh, has there been any negative impact, I suppose, uh, in, in these initiatives? It's funny, I, I, I overheard I do. I'm sorry, Joe. I took no, go ahead. Go ahead, Stephen. No, no, no. Uh, no I, I mean, I'm not from there, so I'm not going to try and dare to speak for anybody from Donegal for a second, right? But I was listening to the radio the other day, and I heard um, Sam McConkey, who we all know from from the last couple of months, on speaking about um, it was all to do with kind of COVID in the north and COVID in Donegal and all that stuff, right? But what he was talking about was the fact that the northwest in general has been underserved by transport links for years, right? So if you think about Dublin to Waterford, Dublin to Limerick, Dublin to Cork, Dublin to Galway, all have a motorway going to them. Dublin to Donegal does not, right? Um, and I had never thought about that before, right? I always just kind of accepted the fact in the back of my head that it was a long drive to Donegal and it was much easier to fly there. Um, but what I think this does is it, it kind of flips that on its head and it says, actually, it'd be lovely to have a road, but you don't need one because you've got the information highway now that, that is going to Donegal. And so... Once you're there, you can do whatever you want. And to, to Gillian's point, um, you know, the broadband is there now, right? And it, it, it might not be perfect in every spot, but as you say, Gillian, too rightly, it's not perfect everywhere in every spot. 5G will help that as time comes along. If you look at the coverage map now, I don't think our draw is covered yet, Gillian, so uh, soon, soon I hope, right? But the coverage maps will show you uh, where the 5G is at right now, and it's, it's, it's getting there. And the speeds on 5G are stupidly fast right so the whole idea of bandwidth problems i think over time will go away and that idea of servicing a community by a road i think over time will almost seem daft uh because you know uh everything can be done you know more or less uh, remotely and and the, the the lifeblood that that can bring into a community by allowing people like Gillian to go and start a business there um or something as, as large as primerica to run there uh, and run so successfully can only be a net positive, I think, right? And um, like, I, as somebody who lives in Dublin and works in Dublin, um, I, I am a huge proponent of saying not every business should be in Dublin because it's jammed, right? There's no need for it all to be here and it doesn't need to be anymore. And if COVID has taught us anything, uh, it's taught us that businesses don't need to be headquartered in the middle of a city centre anymore. It can be done in a different way. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that that will have a net effect of... of positively breathing kind of life into into cities and towns around the country, including Johnny Okay. Yeah, I, I'd echo that sentiment completely. And I think it's a great point. If data is the new oil, um, is broadband the new the new motorway infrastructure equivalent. Mm -hmm. Now that being said, and I'm not. I won't. Won't let it not be said. Like an, a motorway to Donegal would still be nice. Would it still uh, be nice? Eh? <laughs> yeah, Can't we have both? <laughs> it would. It would still be good. But but joking aside, um, like things like investments the Irish government have made with like Project Kelvin off the coast of um of Northern Ireland there, which means that you know Letterkenny sits on a metropolitan area network, which is a complete fibre connection. Primerica's ecosystem and its own uh, data centres sit on on a fibre line that's directly connected to the United States via 
obviously an ocean in between, but you're talking a complete and utter, the network connectivity in, in Donegal and Letterkenny is the exact same as the data centers in, in Jacksonville and Florida as back up to our headquarters. So I think that's an important point. And I do think it's, it's a hugely important thing for the opportunity to grow. 5G is massive as well. Nice thing about 5G is the sheer speeds it's going to be able to bring to maybe regions that can't be served by fiber. I'm lucky enough to be sitting outside Letterkenny here on gig fiber, which is fantastic. Not that long ago, though, I was sitting on satellite broadband. So I think it's, it's a significant shift. And I think it, the more we can do about that, the more it can, it can do. The ecosystem's important as well, because we've seen over the years, even some people have left Primerica, have gone on to set up startups, like Dave Gilday out of Cloud Ranger and a lot of his team are ex-employees of Primerica. I'm not saying Primerica is taking credit for Cloud Ranger, but when Cloud Ranger needed a first customer, we were one of the early customers with them. And again, I think what I'm talking about is people that develop talent and in Primerica goes out and maybe has a successful startup and were there to be one of our speakers at the North by Northwest tech community. So I think it goes both ways. And just to finish on uh, before I pass to Gillian, the other thing in terms of people coming into the region, how it benefits. So I'm a Sligo man. Uh, I coach uh, Gaelic and soccer here in, I live out in Glen Swilly out and you're here in New Mills. So obviously as a Sligo man I had to bring up to Donegal and show them how, to, how GA gets played because of obviously the history <laughs> of the strength of Sligo GA versus uh, Donegal. So, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure many out there <laughs> lay claim to that. Yeah, I, Stephen, I'd echo the two, the two guys completely on, you know, what the future looks like in terms of data. But at a community level, if you take a step back, there's been a lot of negative PR on about if people move to rural Ireland, the house prices are going to go up. And, you know, there's always this scaremongering that goes on. But let's call a spade a spade here. If Donegal was to have a slight increase in population we're not going to run out of land anytime soon, right? There's tons and tons of tons of space. It's magnificent. But what it will drive is rebuilding rural Ireland, reimagining what rural Ireland could look like and what community could be. Increased numbers in schools means increased facility, demands from the government. It means better healthcare systems and actually generally better infrastructure overall. But for my point, I'm from the outside. Joe, you're from the outside as well. You're not a native Donegal person. Diversity breeds innovation. And actually, as we look towards the future and we have the data infrastructure to do and grow innovation, actually having people coming in with different ideas or who've been away and are coming home and bringing their families with them, that all just adds to innovation and it, it'll help us in the future. Yeah, St Stephen, I might just make one final point. I think I'm the only Donegal person here, albeit, I suppose, like a lot of people, I wasn't born in Donegal either. Um, <laughs> I agree I agree absolutely with the comments that were made. Look, part of the wider council role, I suppose, is to try to maintain the wider social fabric of the county. Uh, the, the economy is the part, the oil, that keeps all of that together. So alongside all of the regeneration projects that you see in the different towns and villages, we need to make sure we have a strong employment base. And that needs to be continually developed by the likes of guys coming in from Kildare or even Sligo, notwithstanding the jibe about football. I won't even go, go there, Joe. Uh, but it's great. It, 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 is, it is part of what we are. You know, we, we, we're part of a wider Northwest ecosystem. We don't just sit alone on a, on a, on a little part of the Republic of Ireland. So it's, it's a very strong mixture. And the mixture that, that you guys are bringing to it as well will add to the strength of the county going into the future. And the investment that you see from central government and local government, you know, aims to add value to what you guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Thanks, uh, Stephen. That's all. Well, I'd like to thank all three speakers for very interesting and informative, inspirational presentations. And I hope everyone got, uh, um, got something out of it. Um, our last... Uh, um, segment is going to be from Craig O'Keefe of Imagine. He, uh, Craig is going to give us um, three VR demo videos. They came out of a, uh, a European funded project, uh, an interreg project for the Atlantic area, I think it was called Capitan. And uh, I think put your little glasses on and sit back and enjoy. Yes, I hope everyone can see my screen here. Uh, please let me know if you can't. Um, but yeah, um, this is very unique first and foremost for Imagine. We've never done a, a virtual virtual reality demo uh, online. It's, it's, uh, it, this is pretty unique, but so hopefully this goes smoothly. Um, before I, I get into it, I just want to talk a little bit about um, Imagine and, and what and the project that we did here in Donegal and, and just a little bit of a, give, give a background kind of to 360 VR and what that is. You would have heard a lot about 
technology in, in these many great presentations, but um, just to give a bit of a sense of kind of what we, we're about. So uh, I'm just going to get into it here. Um, so imagine our a virtual reality company or, or kind of a studio creative agency. I think we actually funnily struggle, struggle with what we are most of the time, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you know we're, we're actually in, in business 20 years and we're founded by Peter Grow and, and Aaron Jay in, in the heart of Waterford City. So uh, about, about, I suppose, three years ago, um, after being a studio for 17 years, uh, doing mainly web, VR, uh, web design and uh, video, uh, we had an opportunity to create a virtual reality experience in the heart of Waterford City. So as many people may or may not know, we have quite a Viking history in Waterford, and uh, there is a very famous building called the Reginald's Tower, and, and behind that, the, there is an area called the, uh, the Viking Triangle. Um, and we were brought an opportunity to create a uh, kind of immersive, uh, kind of first of its kind virtual reality historical experience. Um, and we had never done that before, to be totally honest. So uh, we put our heads together and, and managed to create um, a, a brand new department in Imagine, um, a virtual reality department. And we managed to create a first world's first Viking VR experience. And we did it in the middle of a um, basically a Franciscan church in Waterford City in the Viking Triangle. So as you see here, uh, there is a picture of Bart and a lady with a virtual headset on it. And that is the, the Viking house that we actually built in the middle of this church. So um, it's, a, it's an incredible building and it's um, still, I suppose, uh, the number one visited attraction in Waterford City, but it's, it's, it's gone on to be multi-award winning. So it's, it's kind of our, our, the starting project, but it's, it's something that we really started on and, and has amazing uh, reviews to this day. But I suppose over the last three years, and uh, we've built on that. Uh, even as a studio, and um, we we still continue to do web, we still continue to do design and, and video. But we've tried to marry all of that with the virtual reality. So since twenty seventeen, we've gone on to do I think seven experiences. Now, most recently, we we've, we've created a virtual reality experience in um, in Croatia. For anyone who's familiar with with Split and the Diocletian's Palace, are there it's a, it's a it's a palace that's now ruined, but we've actually put a, a virtual reality experience uh, in a palace in Croatia. And uh, we brought we we basically bring people into the palace and then put headsets on them and, and get them to feel like what it was back uh, when Diocletian was the uh, the former emperor uh, back in that city. Um, but I suppose over the last over the last three years, the, the focus and the future of Imagine is about trying to kind of ma marry all of these these skills that we have and and create experiences in virtual reality, but in 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 all all elements of our business. But I suppose we see we see kind of massive potential and and. You know, uh, people like Joe spoke about it, and uh, and Stephen at the start about you know virtual reality and augmented reality and these things really helping businesses and commercial entities in their in in how they can you know improve efficiencies in the future. So that's what Imagine are working on um, at the moment, and, and continually doing the tourism elements. So I'll, I'll get into what what is 360 virtual reality. So 360 VR, um, you know. For anyone who doesn't know, is it's essentially a 360 camera, and that that is that captures 360 video, um, and once that footage is captured, fundamentally it can then be then be transformed into a, a VR experience and through rendering. So, you know, wh why do we use 360 VR to create to create these sort of tourist experiences? But well, first and foremost, for anyone who, who may not may not be familiar with, with with a headset and how to put it on, and um, virtual reality is the the modern teleportation device. Um, a lot of people use augmented reality uh, or, or augmented reality in VR. We, we get these acronyms and we, we tend to throw them all in together with IoT and you'll all be familiar with them. But um, to understand, because AR and VR are generally put together, uh, augmented reality is, is, is fundamentally about augmenting your around you or augmenting your current world. But virtual reality is about uh, creating a virtual world through a computer generated experiences or, or as we'll see today, through a video on YouTube. And um, so, yeah, VR is the, is the transportation device and um, 360 VR is, 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 as you see in this beautiful picture, um, a way of transporting people to destinations they may or may never get to go and see uh, or may really want to go and see and generally will get to we'll get to bring them there before they do. And that's why it's such an incredibly powerful marketing tool. And as I'll, I'll go on to talk about the, uh, the experience that we created for Donegal, um, this has become a, a very incredible part marketing tool, not so much unfortunately with COVID, but um, as, as you see, lots of many big companies in the world use it now, can be used to uh, showcase uh, current products and can be used to showcase actual um, destinations in a, in a really powerful way because it, it creates this pre-connection for people before arriving um, at places. So it's, it's really cool. So um, imagine our essentially storytellers, as you see from my search slide. So 
you, why we use 360 VR or why we tell, use virtual reality as a way of telling stories is, is really important to who we are as a company. So immersive storytelling is, is, uh, is, a, is the future, really, in many ways of, of, of people, how they tell stories through tech. But we, we always do say, and even though this will be a fairly tech-heavy um, and innovation-heavy uh, speech, we, we, we do talk about storytelling being the most important element of what we do. So um, in effect, storytelling, you know, it's, we, we always use the example of Martin Scorsese, for example, you know, and not that we are, we are claiming to be Martin Scorsese or anything like that, but, you know, nobody asks when they're at the cinema, what, what camera did he use, you know? So when, we, when we're creating our movies in virtual reality, um, the tech really is, is just a vessel for, for creating these stories. And the, the true line for any, any experience that we've created, whether it be Donegal, whether it be in Norway in, in a Viking ship or whether it be in, 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 in Waterford, it's always been about creating these, these stories that, that capture people's imaginations. And, and, you know, we kind of always like to say that it's, it's kind of the, the way of presenting, it's the, the future's way of presenting history um, in, in a really beautiful way. So that's, that's, that's what can be achieved with this type of technology. Um, but also about the promotion of sustainability, and it's, it's something that I'm sure everyone is aware of, and, and it's why it's so important. Donegal is such an important story as we talk about leaving big cities and our, and our impact on the planet. Um, using these types of this type of technology and this type of storytelling can can allow people to travel to places that they never have done before. It can it can reverse the effects of over tourism, which we know. And look, I'm not saying that we don't need to get more people to Donegal. We absolutely need to get people to Donegal because not only is it a very innovative place, but it's a, it's a very inspirational uh, place. That's probably the most important, I think. And um, so we we need to ensure that you know it, it can be done sustainably. But this type of technology really assists that. And um, so. You know the Donegal 360 experience, and before I, I go into it, I'll just explain. You know what? Imagine we're tasked with doing. We had, we're essentially tasked with producing three standalone high impact 360 videos, and essentially what that was was was, was an in app experience that that was allowed and and, and access through a, a virtual reality headset, and that was of the three iconic locations: so Schlee, Vig, Fawnet Head, and Malin Head. And as I mentioned previously, because Imagine are not just necessarily a VR company. We are a design studio, so we design the app. We're a web studio, so we build the app. And we are a video company, so we shoot the footage. And then we're a virtual reality company, so we manage to marry all of those skills and put it actually into a headset uh, and make it usable and navigatable for, for somebody who's putting the headset on for the first time. So it's a complete end-to-end uh, -end experience from, from Imagine. And then because we love history and we love telling stories, each video was narrated to tell the history of each signature point. And that's so important because a lot of the times when, when we put these headsets on and we see, you know, whether it, whether it be, oh, you know, Paris or wherever we want to get to transport it, I think the real key point is that, you know, there's a bit of history. It's like getting on the bus in, in, in Paris and get brought it around. And you put the, when you put the earphones in, it tells you about the locations and the points that you're at. And I think that really adds to the, the connection and, and being remembering what, what you got to see on that day. So, and that's important to see uh, when I play this next video. So, I, so this is the point, I suppose, that it's going to be, a little bit of a uh, first time ever we've done this. So essentially all of these experiences are now live on, uh, on YouTube. And uh, thanks to Donegal and, and Joy Harren for helping us out with that. So they're all live on YouTube and all be, can be viewed through uh, Google uh, Cardboard Viewers or normal Cardboard Viewers, or you can make your home Cardboard Viewers. But uh, the good people at Donegal County Council have sent out the, uh, the viewers uh, for anyone who has received one ahead of time and has the, had the opportunity hopefully to pre-assemble it which it can be a little bit finicky. Um, they can now hopefully have this video preloaded on YouTube and, and can, they can jump in. It's about four minutes long, but for anyone who doesn't have it, I'm just gonna play the video through here. Um, I am going to try and move the 360 view around so everybody gets a sense of seeing the full 360 of Schlieb League. Um, it's about four minutes long and I'm not gonna to go too fast because I know that could potentially make people sick and I do not want to do that. And uh, so I'm just gonna play it now and hopefully everybody can hear and uh, see uh, the experience. So if there's any issues, do let me know, but anyone who has a viewer should be, should be turning them on now. The sounds off, Craig. There, you might need to, um, you know, on your screen share and settings, there should be an option there for 
sound just, or audio. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, just one second there. Of enormous local importance, okay. this ancient landscape was a destination for countless Christian pilgrims throughout the ages. The gruelling pilgrimage concluding with a near three kilometre ascent along the pilgrim's path to the monastery, not far from the mountain summit. The remnants of the chapel of St. Asicus and the ruins of the monks' beehive huts are all that remain on the site. Not far from the pilgrim's path is the remnants of a mass rock, a flat altar-like boulder used to celebrate secret masses during times of Catholic persecution between the 17th and 19th centuries. St. Asicus was one of St. Patrick's earliest followers and close friend. He was appointed Bishop of Elphin in County Roscommon following its establishment by St. Patrick in the mid-5th century. He was later appointed Abbot Bishop of Ireland, but, never fully enjoying his prominence within the church, he resigned his office and lived a hermit's life at the top of St. Leo. Just a short walk from the soaring cliffs, a single Martello tower stands facing out into the North Atlantic. The tower was used by occupying British forces during the Napoleonic War to spot any French invasion of Ireland as a prelude to invading Britain. This lone sentinel of a structure serves as a reminder of Ireland's involvement in European wars over the centuries. But the most awe-inspiring feature of Sleeve Lake is, of course, the very cliffs themselves. The enormous face comprised of quartzite, gneiss and karst limestone rock bursting from the Atlantic Ocean and soaring nearly 2,000 feet into the sky. Formed during the last ice age some 10,000 years ago, the cliffs form part of the International Appalachian Trail and have corresponding rock formations in Newfoundland, Canada. This iconic landscape of astonishing beauty has inspired hundreds of thousands of visitors and captured the hearts of musicians, painters and poets throughout the centuries. The Belfast-born naturalist Robert Lloyd Prager once wrote, A tall mountain of nearly 2,000 feet, precipitous on its northern side, has been devoured by the sea. So I hope I worked. That's the first time I've ever done that. So I uh, hope that absolutely made sense and everyone got to, to, to see Schlieve League. Um, well, thanks, thanks very much, Craig. I think many of us would testify to going to see Sleeve League, even on a sunny day, only to discover you can't see it at all. So <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be able to see it in, in, in VR. Good. Well, um, I'd like to thank, thanks again, Craig. I'd like to thank... Um, Jillian, uh, Stephen and, and Joe again for, for the presentations, but uh, most of all, thank you for the, the 70 or so uh, people who signed up for the webinar today and uh, a few fell off at the end, probably didn't have their glasses, you know, um, <laughs> a good majority of them there stayed the course and I really appreciate it. If you want, uh, I'd also like to thank for the, the team in Donegal County Council for putting together this event. Um, it's a sizable undertaking. It went ahead hitch-free and they've done a great job. Um, if you want any further information, um, please contact the Economic Development Unit in Donegal County Council. That email is uh, economicdevelopment at donegalcoco.ie, C-O-C-O. Um, I think some of the presentations will be available if you need them. 
just one last uh, thing I've been asked to do, and uh, that is that there's a uh, a pre accelerator program for female female entrepreneurs uh, closing uh, called Ambition. It uh, closes in three days' time. Uh, so if there are any uh, females on the call still who would like to start that journey of a, a startup, please um, have a look at that. And that information is available from the Leo, info at leo.donegalcoco.ie. Okay, so thanks very much, very much and good luck, luck everybody. Stay, stay safe. Bye. Thanks, folks. Thanks, guys. Thank you.